All right, we're in Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. We're going to start down at verse number uh, 19. <clears throat> and it mentioned to us at the end of our last um, study together in here, here in Hebrews that verse 18 ends the what we sometimes call the doctrinal part of the book, uh, the, the teaching part in the sense of uh, the writer laying out his argument about the superiority of Jesus. And verse 19 of chapter 10 starts the application of that. If all of this is true, and it is, then what are we supposed to do with that as Christians? How does it affect the way that we think and the way that we act and the way that we live our lives? And so we're going to begin seeing that starting here in uh, verse number 19. Just real quick to remind ourselves of uh, where we left off. Uh, verse number 14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So in the end of chapter 10 we were talking about the sacrifice of Jesus and how there was only one. He only had to die once because of the power of his sacrifice and, and of his blood, because of the perfect life that he lived, because of the nature of his sacrifice that he willingly gave himself in the place of others. Even though he was sinless, he was suffering on our behalf, and that satisfied the justice of God, paid the price for sin, so there doesn't have to be you know, any more sacrifice made for sin and as confirmation of that verse 15 says that the holy ghost is a witness he testifies to this truth and he did that in jeremiah 31 verse 16 quotes from that uh, this is the covenant that i will make with them after those days saith the lord i will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will i write them and their sins and iniquities will i remember no more so the prophecy from jeremiah is fulfilled in christ and in the giving of the New Testament, the gospel, and that means that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice, and therefore the last sacrifice for sins. So verse 18 concludes by saying, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So if sins are forgiven, and they are by the blood of Jesus, then there's no longer a need for another offering or another sacrifice for sins. And so that does away with the law of Moses. There's no more need for animal sacrifice. And it does away with any other system that tries to produce another way for salvation to be accomplished. The sacrifice of Jesus is, uh, is it. Now, building on all of that and, and this entire argument from the beginning of the book that Jesus is superior to and greater than everything else, he begins to make application uh, to us. So verse 19 says, having therefore, based on all of that, therefore, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching." And so that passage is one complete thought in explaining to us, beginning to explain to us what we have in Christ and, again, how that looks in our lives, how it's supposed to affect how we think and how we act. So the first thing we notice is that he calls them brethren. So he reminds us that he's writing to people who are Christians, who have believed in Jesus, who have accepted that he is the sacrifice for sin, they have been washed by his blood in baptism, and so they've been added by the Lord to his body, the church. He's writing to Christians who believe what he's teaching about the sacrifice of Jesus. Sadly, some of these Christians, maybe even many of them, were being tempted to leave Christ and to go back to the law of Moses because of persecution and pressure that was being put on them uh, in their community by their family and all of those things. So even though they knew this, things had become difficult and they were starting to give up, their, give up their faith. But he reminds them that they're brethren, and as he's explained, because 
we're brethren and, and we've you know, taken advantage of this sacrifice that Jesus was made, there are certain things that we have. And one of those is boldness. And he says, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So you want to talk about that for a couple minutes here and what he means by um, having boldness to, to enter. Uh, first of all, the word for boldness here is a word that means um, we think of it being bold in speech. And it has that application being unreserved in one speaking. So not afraid to speak out, not afraid to say what we think or what we believe. So freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech, Thayer defines it as. It also means free and fearless confidence. Or as, again, Thayer says, cheerful courage, boldness, assurance, the deportment by which one becomes conspicuous or secures publicity. So we have a great example of this idea and this word back in Acts chapter 4, and it will give us a little insight into this concept of boldness. So in Acts chapter 4, the apostles, of course, are preaching in, uh, in Jerusalem, and you have Peter and John preaching, and verse 1 says that uh, as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So they're preaching, and the Jewish leadership doesn't like what they're saying, what they're teaching about Jesus. In fact, verse 2 says that they were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they didn't like that they were preaching Jesus and resurrection, that Jesus was raised and therefore that man could be raised from the dead. So they didn't like it. What did they do? Verse 3, they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it's now eventide. So they arrested them. And we know the story that they were approached by the uh, rulers, the elders, the scribes. Even verse 6 says that Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And they brought these apostles into the midst. And so this is like appearing before the Supreme Court of Judaism. The high priest is there. Um, Caiaphas is there. So the other high priest is there. They're only supposed to have one, but they had two at this time. You have all the Jewish leadership. So they're brought before the most prominent names in Judaism, the men who have all authority. These are the men who had Jesus crucified. They have that much power and influence. And they bring Peter and John before them and ask them, you know, by what authority or what name have you done this? And Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Ghost, said, You rulers of Israel, rulers of the people, elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means uh, he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now, the truth of the matter is, if you or I today stood in front of the religious world or the political world or you know, any gathering of people in our world today, and we said exactly what Peter said, we would be hated for it saying that Jesus is the only way of salvation and there's no salvation in anyone except Jesus and that Jewish people were responsible for crucifying him. We would be considered the worst of the worst and be hated among men. But they said that not only in front of, you know, like an audience we might face today, but the very people who had given the order to kill Jesus, the very people who had done all that they did to make sure that he was crucified, Peter looked them in the eye and said, you killed him, and he's the only way that you can be saved. Resurrection of the dead, that's what they wanted them to stop preaching. That's exactly what they were preaching. And verse 13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So that's boldness. Bold, it's not arrogance. It's not, you know, Peter, you know, being arrogant and saying, we, we know better than everyone else because of who we are. He wasn't resting upon his education that he'd been more highly educated than anyone. Obviously, they were ignorant and unlearned. 
but it was a boldness in truth that they knew what they had seen. Jesus had been crucified, and he'd been raised from the dead. They'd seen him. He'd appeared in their midst. They'd been able to touch his body, to know that he was truly raised from the dead. They'd spoken to him, all of those things. They were absolutely convinced of it, plus they were inspired of the Holy Spirit. So they spoke the truth without any fear, without any doubt, without any concern over what might happen to them. They spoke it plainly and clearly. And that's the idea of boldness that we're talking about here. Now, the writer of Hebrews says that we have boldness not to proclaim the truth, even though we do, and we should, and we ought to be just as clear with it as, as Peter and John were, but he says we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And so what he's telling us is that when we are cleansed by Jesus' blood and our sins are washed away, we have complete and total confidence that we can walk through the doorway into the holiest. Now, what's the holiest? We, we've studied about the tabernacle, and we understand the reference that most people had to stay outside of the court. The Jews could come to the court of the tabernacle, bringing their sacrifice, but then the priest took over, but only the priest could go into the holy place. And so the Jewish people could come to the altar. They didn't necessarily approach the laver of water, but they could on occasion, but you could go no further. But the priest just walked through the door of the tabernacle because they had the authority to do that, the right and the boldness. We as Christians now have that same boldness to enter into fellowship with God, into God's family, into the church. We know who we are in Christ, and we're supposed to live with that kind of openness and boldness about us. But it goes beyond that. It's not just into the holy place, but into the holiest, the most holy place. Now, the priest came into the holy place, but they didn't go into the most holy place. They didn't go through the veil. Only one person could do that, the high priest, and he could only do it one day a year, the Day of Atonement, and only carrying blood to offer as a sacrifice. So you didn't just walk through that veil any time you chose to. But the writer of Hebrews says we have boldness to pass through that veil to go into the holiest place. That means that the holy place, the holiest of holies, represented in the tabernacle, heaven. And it represents the throne room of God where his presence is. On earth, it was at the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat in the tabernacle and the temple. And only the high priest could go in there. Actually, God's presence is in heaven. That's where his throne is. And you and I have boldness to enter into his presence in that true most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. That means particularly that when I have a need or a request that I can pray and direct my prayer directly to God the Father on his throne in heaven and know that he will not only allow me to come into his presence, but he will hear my prayer and answer my request. That's the kind of boldness that I have as a Christian. You remember the story of, uh, from the Old Testament, the story of Esther, and how Mordecai wanted her to talk to the king, that they wanted, Haman wanted to kill all of the Jews, and he said, you have the king's ear, go and talk to him. But she understood that if you tried to go into the throne room and the king didn't extend the scepter, then it was, you know, off with your head. You, you're put to death. You didn't just walk into the king's throne room. He had to invite you in. And if you tried to come in on your own and he didn't accept you, then you were put in prison or put to death. Well, that's the image here, that God is king of the universe, king of everything on his throne, and you and I have boldness just to walk right in. He extends the scepter to us. In fact, he invites us to pray to him. He commands us to pray to him and to come before his presence. And so it's a reminder about the privilege of prayer. And at the same time, it's a statement about fellowship, that we live in fellowship with God. You know, we talked about Romans in Romans chapter 8 Sunday night about dwelling in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. That's fellowship, that God is with us all the time and we are with him all the time. 
And that's possible because of the blood of Jesus. And so all these things that the writer of Hebrews has been showing us about how much greater Jesus is than everything else, now we find out how that applies you know, personally in my life. It means that I can enter into the holiest, that I can approach the throne of my Father in heaven, and I can do so with boldness. Now, boldness is not arrogance. There's this word of faith movement that says, uh, if I ask God for something and I truly believe it, God has to give it to me. And so they pray par- prayers demanding God, you do this for me and you do that for me because you promised that you would hear my prayers. We don't have that kind of arrogance when we come to God's throne. We come humbly and submissive to his will and we pray according to his will, but we have the access. And it's a powerful privilege, but it's not something to be taken for granted and not something to be used you know, lightly or, or flippantly. We pray in the right way and with the right attitude. And so we have this boldness to come before God's throne. And it's Jesus' blood that makes that possible. And then just notice what he says in verse 20. He says, by a new and living way. And this, there's a fascinating idea in this statement and this idea about a, a new way. Uh, so far through Hebrews, we, we've been talking about the Old Testament and then the New Testament. And the old was what it was, and then it was fulfilled, and now the New Testament is in effect. He taketh away the first to establish the second. So when we read this, that it's a new and living way, we may have the idea that it's new in relation to the Old Testament. But that's not actually what's being said here. It's a different uh, principle, a different concept that's being given. The idea is that, for example, living under the old law, You know, you'd follow it, and you could follow it faithfully, and it provided a path. But eventually, when you came to the end of that path, when it related to salvation, you came to a dead end. Because, as we've talked about in so many of these studies, you couldn't take sins away by animal sacrifice. So the Old Testament didn't provide a way for those sins to be removed, except in the promise of of Jesus coming. So you're, you're going through the jungle following this path and it comes to a dead end and before you is just a wall of, you know, jungle that can't be penetrated. It's so dense and it's so thick and you wonder, where do we go? And the response is, there's no path. There's no way through this, nowhere to go. And then Jesus comes and he makes a path. That's what's meant by a new way here. Not that there's this old way that you can walk if you want to, and then over here there's this new way. It's there's no path, and then Jesus makes a new path. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he meant that literally. He is the way, the only way. There is no other path to salvation. There's no other path to the Father in heaven. Have boldness to come before his throne. It's a wonderful thing, but you can't have it without Jesus. He is the new way, the new path, and there is no other. So whatever man may try to find salvation or to find fellowship with God or you know, whatever it is, a pure conscience, all these things we've talked about, there's no path to those things except Jesus. And he came into the world to give us that path, and he did so by the life that he lived, and of course the example that he set through that, and the doctrine that he taught. And so his way is the new way. It's the only way to get from here to to heaven. And it's a living way because, of course, Jesus was crucified, but he rose from the dead. He is a living sacrifice. We're going to get to that eventually in Romans, in our study of Romans, in Romans 12, that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. That sounds contradictory. Something that's sacrificed is dead, but Jesus was sacrificed, yet he lives He's a living sacrifice, and we have to become living sacrifices. But the idea is it's a living way because he lives and it gives life. And so this new way that he's charted for us and provided for us is a way of life. So we have spiritual life now through the forgiveness of our sins, and it will continue into eternity, and we'll have eternal life in heaven. But that's the gospel. It's a new and living way. It's new because it's the only way, and it's living because it gives life. And so that's made possible 
by the blood of Jesus. So by his blood, he ratified the new covenant, which provides us boldness to come before God's throne and this new and living way. Verse 20 says, which he consecrated or hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. Consecrated is the idea of dedicated. And so he, he charted the course himself and he's the one that set it apart and said, this is the way. And so he, again, demonstrated that in his life and then through his teaching. It's through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So it took the sacrifice of Jesus to make this, this possible. And the thing that makes it possible is the fact that he was willing to offer himself as the, the price, the sacrifice uh, for our sins. So when it says through the veil, that is to say his flesh, it means the offering of his, his body, his sacrifice. Um, when we think about Jesus dying on the cross, one of the things that you know, stands out is the rending of the veil in the temple from the top to the bottom. Um, that's being referenced here in this idea of the veil, which is his flesh. And the idea is that what Jesus did in dying on the cross you know, when that veil tore, it symbolized that the way to the most holy place was now made open and available to men, that we could now access God and his throne through Jesus and through what he did. Um, the tearing of the veil took place after the tearing of his flesh. And so his body was, was torn, his back obviously by the scourge and his hands and feet by, by the nails, his side by the spear. The flesh was torn, and in like manner, the veil was rent, torn in two. And so the, the sacrificing of his body is what opened the way to God, to, to salvation and to heaven. And the other side of that is, not only is now that we have you know, access to what was behind the veil, but when the veil is torn, what was back there is now open to the world. Everybody can see it. Um, remember that when the, the Ark of the Covenant, after it was made, you know, and put in the holy place, most holy place in the tabernacle, whenever they moved that thing, uh, the priests, you know, that went in there to get it, before they went in there to get it, they took the veil down and put it over it and covered it up. And it was wrapped in the veil when, when they carried it around. Nobody saw the Ark of the Covenant, you know. Uh, there were occasions when it was seen after it was captured in battle and, and so forth, and David brought it back and those things. But for the most part, it was, it was hidden, and nobody ever laid eyes on it. But now that veil's torn open, and, you know, there's an earthquake. Anybody who walks up to the temple can look in and see the Ark of the Covenant. And that symbolized, again, what God was doing through Jesus. He's opening the door to all of the mysteries of heaven all of these things that have been mysteries for ages and ages of men, now the, the door is open and you can see what God was doing, what he was planning. And that's what takes place in the, the revelation of the New Testament. All the mysteries are revealed. You didn't understand you know, that prophecy? Well, here's what it meant and how it related to Jesus and the church and, and all of those things. And so it opened the way for us to approach God but it also opened the way for God to reveal truth to us. And so the completion of the New Testament is the completion of Revelation. And not just the book of Revelation, but of Revelation altogether. It is God's complete word to man. We don't need anything added to it after the book of Revelation. This is the whole story. God's shown us the, the prophecies and now he's given us the fulfillment and all of that was made possible through Jesus. So the shedding of his blood, the tearing of his flesh, and, and, and all involved in his sacrifice gives us access to the Father in heaven, but also allowed God to reveal to us the truth that we needed so that we have the faith once delivered, Jude verse 3, once for all time delivered, we have everything that we need to know, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Everything we need is in this book. And again, it's through Jesus that all this is, is made possible. So that's through the veil, that is to say, 
his flesh. And then verse 21 says, having an high priest over the house of God, which is what these last couple of chapter, chapters um, have been focusing on, Jesus' role as high priest. And so we won't retread all of that. But he's reminding us this is what we have as Christians because of Jesus' blood. We have boldness to enter into the holiest. We have a new and living way that Jesus has provided for us through the veil, his flesh. So it gives us access to the Father, reveals to us truth. And we have a high priest over the house of God, which is Jesus. And he's the perfect high priest, both God and man, tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, able to help those who are tempted, all of those things. Because of that, because God has accomplished all of this and done all of this, here is what we're supposed to do. And there are three things. Number one, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. That's what we're supposed to do toward God. Number two, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. That's what we're supposed to do toward ourselves. And number three, let us consider one another and provoke unto love and to good works. That's what we're supposed to do to each other, to our fellow man, particularly to the church, but in a sense to, to all men. So toward God, toward self, and toward man. This is what you do because of who God is and what he's given us. And also when you look at that, you, you find faith toward God. You find hope because we are uh, holding on to what we've professed. And then you, you find love, love toward our fellow man, especially love toward the church. Faith, hope, and love toward God, ourself, and toward our man. It covers the broad spectrum of our lives as Christians. So let's talk about these three things as we have time. First of all, let us draw near. It means to draw closer to with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now we talked about the last part of that verse earlier when we were talking about uh, sprinkling back in uh, chapter 9, verse 13, the blood of bulls and of goats, the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So just like the blood was sprinkled under the Old Testament and that sanctified them, so Christ's blood is sprinkled upon us. That happens, the sprinkling of the blood, when our bodies are washed with pure water. So when we go down into the waters of baptism, the blood of Christ is applied and we're raised in newness of life, having our evil conscience removed, replaced with a pure and clean one. So we've sinned, we've done wrong, and we want to make that right. When we are washed in the waters of baptism by the blood of Jesus, that evil conscience is removed, and it's replaced with a pure conscience that says, even though I did wrong, I'm forgiven, and now I have no sin. And so my conscience is pure. And we strive from that moment forward to keep our conscience clean. So after being baptized, becoming a Christian, a member of the Lord's church, our job is to draw near. From that moment through the rest of our life on earth, every day we're supposed to get closer and closer to God. To be closer to him today than we were yesterday than we were when we first obeyed the gospel. That's growing as a Christian. So we draw near, and it takes a true heart. So our conscience is clean. Our heart has to be true, um, devoted to truth. Obviously, true relates to the Word of God. And so we let our heart be guided by what the Word teaches us. That's being led by the Spirit, as we saw from Romans 8. So a true heart is a heart that is led only by truth, by, by what the Word of God says and in full assurance of faith. So it's a faith that has complete confidence in God and in his word. So what God has told us to do, we do because God told us to do it. Even if it doesn't make sense sometimes in the world that we live in, or even if we reason and rationalize and say, I think it would be better to do it this way, we do what God says because we have a full assurance of faith complete confidence in him that he's right and his word is true. These Hebrew Christians were struggling with that. They knew what God said. Jesus is the only way, stay true to him. 
but they're being arrested and they're being persecuted and they have family members who are Jews who are accusing them of abandoning God and abandoning the law and abandoning their family and their traditions and all of these things. They have all of this pressure and all of you know, these things that are happening to try to draw them away. And even though they know God says this is the right way, they're starting to think, well, maybe this way is better. Well, the writer of Hebrews says our job is to draw closer to God by doing what he says with full assurance of faith that even if it doesn't look like it, even if the world is telling us differently, God's way is the right way. And so we have to keep getting closer and closer to him. And oftentimes doing that means getting further and further away from, you know, those things that would keep us from God. And so obviously that, you know, sin, sinful actions, but sometimes it's even relationships. And maybe, you know, like Abraham had to be separated from Lot, maybe they're going to have to be separated from their family that's trying to pull them back into the old ways and the law of Moses. But that's part of getting closer to God. You have to get further away from those who are far away from God. And so that's the first step here, draw near, again, because of who we are and what we have in Christ. Secondly, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. So the profession of our faith is the confession of our faith. The word profession and confession are interchangeable, often in the King James Version. And so he's talking about the good confession that we made when we became Christians and what they had said when they became Christians. Every one of them, you know, who had obeyed the gospel had made that good confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They made that acknowledgement before they were baptized because with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we have to confess our faith in Jesus before we can be washed by his blood. It's part of the, the plan of salvation. So they'd all made that confession. And when you or I, or when they made that confession and said Jesus is the Son of God, they were acknowledging that because he's the Son of God, he is our only hope of salvation. He is now our king, and he rules in our lives. We're becoming citizens of his kingdom He's the head of his body, the church. So they were pledging their loyalty and their allegiance to him that from this moment forward, Jesus is in charge of, of my life. And we all made that same confession when we became Christians. But they were not holding fast to that. Again, they were being pressured and persecuted and because of that, desiring to let go of what they had confessed to be the truth. That, yes, we said Jesus is the Son of God, but things were easier when we were, you know, following the Old Testament. We weren't persecuted like this. So he's telling them to hold on to, to hold fast. You go back earlier in the book to chapter 2 about letting it drift away, drift by. That if we're not careful, that's what happens to us. We drift away from the Word of God. We're not actively you know trying to run away or to get away but by being careless and not focusing as we should we can we can let it slip and it comes out of our grip like sand through our fingers right so we have to hold on to it to what we profess that Jesus is the son of God and do that without wavering there's there's no room for doubt and you notice that in those two verses in verse 22 it's a, a true heart with a full assurance of faith not a little bit of faith and not, you know, 80% faith, but full assurance of faith, complete confidence in God. And here it's hold fast without wavering. Not you can waver every once in a while when things get difficult. There's, there's no wavering at all. Don't ever give up. Don't ever doubt that God is God and that Jesus is his son and that his word is true. And the reason is, he says, for he is faithful that promised. God never wavers. He's never wavered on a single promise that he ever made. He, he kept every one of them exactly as he said he would and for our benefit so we could have all these things that we enjoy in Christ. And so if God is faithful in all of his promises, then I have to be faithful in mine, my promise to follow him, you know, until, until death. 
And so hold fast to ourselves what we confess to be true. And then lastly, just quickly here, we're out of time, but verse 24 says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And so toward our brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a responsibility to, to consider each other, to think about one another. It means to ponder upon my influence on my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to make sure that that influence provokes them to greater love and to greater works, good works in the kingdom, not provoke or motivate someone toward unfaithfulness, to giving up their faith, to quitting the church, as we say sometimes, going back to the old law or whatever it is. I never want to be a discouragement, but always an encouragement. And so I have to consider that because of who Jesus is. And all of those things come together with the assembly. And we'll talk about that in our next lesson, Lord willing, in verse 25, and the importance of Christians coming together. God makes it abundantly clear how important that is, and we'll spend some time talking about that. We're out of time here tonight. We'll stop there and pick up verse 25 next time. Two five nine, number two hundred fifty nine, will be our song of invitation. Two five nine. In our Bible class tonight, we were in Hebrews chapter ten, and we were talking about the new and living way that is consecrated for us by Jesus through His blood. And those words are found in verse twenty of chapter uh, ten. Verse nineteen says, "Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus." By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We're talking about that word new, and so often in studying Hebrews and, and other times in the New Testament, when we read the word new, you think about comparison to the old. That was the old way, and now this is uh, the new way. But this is a, a different word for new, and it's the only time that this specific Greek word is used in the New Testament, and at its most basic, the word means uh, freshly slaughtered. It's the idea of an animal that had just been killed uh, for a sacrifice. So it was living, and now it's newly dead, and the, the power and the efficacy of that blood you know, is available, which obviously couldn't take away sins, but that's the, the idea of the word. And so it has to do with something new that didn't exist before. And so when we compare the new to the old, this, this word actually shows us that even with the Old Testament, there wasn't a way to salvation. The goal of the Old Testament was to bring men to Christ. It was to show sin to be exceeding sinful so we would understand that we need a Savior 
and we would put our trust and our faith in God to deliver that Savior, and then whoever that Savior was, we would follow him. The goal was always to bring men to Jesus, never to produce salvation by animal sacrifice. So they were saved, obviously, when they faithfully kept the law because God is faithful and he knew that Jesus was going to die and that blood covered those sins also. But the Old Testament by itself without Jesus could not save. So we talked about tonight it's like coming upon a, an impenetrable you know, portion of, of the forest or of the jungle and there's no way to get through it and you're looking for a path and there, there's, there's no path there. And then Jesus appears, and he cuts through it all and makes a, a straight and clear path directly to the destination, which is our Father in heaven. That's exactly what he came to do and what he did when he came into this world. By his example, the life that he lived, he showed us the path to heaven, to salvation, and to the Father. And when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6, that's exactly what he meant. He is the one and only way. Before him, there was no way. And besides him, there is no way. In Acts chapter 4, we noted tonight, talking about the boldness of Peter and John, what Peter preached on that occasion was, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other way. Jesus is the only path, the only way, the only means of salvation. That's why Hebrews 12 and verse 2 calls him the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author of it and the finisher of it. Sometimes we think of that as the beginner and the ender. But those, those words, author and finisher, also have to do with charting a course, making a path. And that's what Jesus did. He, he cleared out everything to show us the direct way to the Father in heaven. And what the writer of Hebrews says is because of him and who he is and his superiority to the angels of heaven and to Moses and to Aaron and to Abraham and to all the heroes of faith of the Old Testament and to every other human being and every other system of belief or religion that ever existed, because he is superior, he is the one and the only one who has given us the boldness to enter into the holiest. Have you ever thought about that when it comes to your prayers? How audacious it would be to pray to God if he had not asked us to do that. Given us the privilege to call upon God and to ask him to do something for me. Who am I to ask the creator of the universe to do anything on my behalf? But I do it, and I do it every day, and I do it several times a day. We all do. We pray at our meals, and we pray when we wake up, and we, go, we, we pray all the time as Christians. Why do we do that without even thinking about it? Because of Jesus. He's given us boldness to come before God's throne. We, we don't even question talking to our Father in heaven. And that's because of Jesus. That's what he made available for us. Let's never take it for granted, that wonderful privilege that we have, and let's use that privilege as God has instructed us because there's great power in it, but let's never forget that without Jesus, none of this would be possible, and that's what he did by providing a way for us. So I hope that we'll remember it and it'll encourage us in our, in our daily life not to grow weak and not to grow faint and not to give up and, and to stop serving him or to become disloyal but to be faithful even unto death because he is the only way. And his yoke is easy, his burden is light. The way that he's provided for us is a straight way and a narrow way, but it's an easy path to follow. When he is our shepherd, we're, we're submissive to his will. So I hope we'll remember that and it'll encourage us in our daily walk and that it will remind us of the importance of letting others know that this is the only way to, to salvation, the only way to heaven, and teach them and tell them about Jesus. But if you're here tonight and you're not on that way, following the path that Jesus has set for us, you've never been cleansed from your sin by his blood, we encourage you to think seriously about it and to change your life by making the decision to obey the gospel. The steps are simple. Hear the truth, believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess his name, and then be baptized for the remission of sins. Having done that, live the faithful life. If you've started on that journey but have become unfaithful, repent of your wrongs, confess them, pray for forgiveness, that wonderful privilege that we can just ask God 
and he will forgive. We'll pray with and for you. God will forgive as he promised. If you need help with that, we'll do that in any way that we can. If you'll come forward as we stand and as we sing. While we pray and while we pray.